Puerto Rico, the United States took over the island and never left. Puerto Rico is an accidental imperial inheritance of the Spanish-American War. Nobody went to war to own Puerto Rico. Basically, we just send a bunch of American office holders and generals down to run the place. One of the first things that the government did was change the language of instruction in the public schools of Puerto Rico to English. Kids in Puerto Rico were learning about George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, but they were not learning about the history of their own island. <laughs> Benign assimilation, as the policy was called, was accompanied by real improvements to the island. As the Americans built roads, hospitals, sewers. U.S. companies invested millions in sugar, creating thousands of jobs. That helps to foster a sense of optimism about what life might look like under American rule. But Puerto Ricans also come to realize that they occupy a very ambiguous status. Puerto Ricans had no vote in the Congress, had obviously no senators. The governors were sent by the president, uh, and Congress essentially dictated the affairs of the island. And Congress was not of a mind to either grant Puerto Rico independence or grant it statehood. One prominent Puerto Rican, Luis Munoz Rivera, appealed to the U.S. to define the status of Puerto Rico. We are a people without a country, a flag, almost without a name. Who are we? What are we? Are we citizens or are we subjects? Congress took one step toward clarifying the question, granting Puerto Ricans U.S. citizenship in 1917. But they would enjoy only limited rights. They would have no representation in the U.S. Congress and could not elect their own governor. What they could do was travel freely to the United States. They came aboard the Coamo, the Borinquen. They came to work in the tobacco and rope factories and dockyards of New York City. In some families, there were collections that were taken so that one member of the family could migrate. Those decisions were not made lightly because it cost about $25, which was an enormous amount of money. Bernardo Vega, a cigar roller from the mountains of Puerto Rico, was a passenger on the Coamo. The overriding theme of our conversations on the ship was what we expected to find in New York City. For savings would be for sending for close relatives. Years later, the time would come to return home with pots of money. Everyone's mind was on that farm we would be buying. It is true of every group who has ever made the voyage from Puerto Rico. The intention is always, it's going to be the move that's going to better their circumstances. But in the long run, they're always going to come back home. And the sad part about it is that they almost never do. They're going to have children and their children are going to have families and they are going to be rooted here. By 1920, more than 10,000 Puerto Ricans had settled in New York, in Brooklyn, the Lower East Side, and East Harlem, El Barrio. Bernardo Vega got a job as a cigar worker, married and had two children. He would never get the farm of his dreams back home but he helped pioneer what would in time become a nation on two shores, with more Puerto Ricans in the United States than on the island of Puerto Rico. 